Uh, the main clinics is uh, Obviously, that's where Dr. Andy Bali, he is a chief psychiatrist at the Amen Clinics. And uh, he, they are sponsoring this program, pretty much. And just to let you know that they ha the Change Your Brain, Change Your Life package is going to be is available for at a discount. And it's on our homepage of our, of our website. And I really encourage you to take advantage of this. This is a whole package of our CDs, DVDs, uh, workbooks, and then, the, of course, the best-selling book itself. Change your brain, change your life. A lot to be said for for being uh, for understanding how your brain works and what your brain needs to needs in order to to function optimally. And there's a code on our site that you can take advantage of to purchase that uh, that package at the discount. Now, Sherry Platt, that's my dear friend and partner, who's really like I said earlier today that she's the brains behind all this. She makes all this work. Our goal, as you can see before you, is to give you and present you with the, 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 the best information. Now, I know that's a tall order, but the combination of the best and the most useful really is our goal because you can give, someone can give you all the most important information and data, but if you, the lay person, cannot use it, cannot apply it when you need to apply it, well, then that information is useless. So we want to be able to break things down so that you, the layperson, especially the layperson, and we have obviously lots of present even people who join us who are professionals, healthcare professionals, and in the different fields, uh, and they use it obviously to help their patients as well. But in the final analysis, you own your body, and you're the one who knows what you need to do, or you're the one who feels the pain the most. Our, our, at, in, a, in attempting to, re to reach that goal, uh, we have a two-fold mission to present the basics, the fundamentals, how things work, how your mind works, how your body works. That is the absolute bottom line. That is the most important thing for you to understand. Now, based upon that, we want to help you find out the right, the, the, the right information if for some reason things are not working like, like, like they should be. Like for instance, if you have depression. Uh, there are good ways to treat depression, there are bad ways to treat depression, and that's what Dr. Gary Moak is going to help us, help sort out for us today. And I'm really, really looking forward to it. I've, I've had a sneak peek at his slides, and I tell you, I'm really, really impressed with what he has to say. Now, this is a disclaimer slide. Dr. Gary Moak will be talking about treatment, obviously, uh, but we have to, ca uh, to caution you, do not make any drastic changes if you are already on treatment. Do not make any drastic changes without consulting with your physician first. This, these webinars are not for the purpose of you treating yourself. They are for the purpose of you being enlightened about how and uh, about treatments, how better to interact with your doctor, how better to get the best out of your interaction with your doctor. So that's very, very important. Do not begin to self-medicate and, 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 and make changes uh, on your own. It's very, very important that you uh, that we say this and that you realize that as well. And I'm sure most of you already do. The power of prevention. I just want to say this really quickly. And we've had Dr. Lep Lepke do an excellent presentation on prevention. And what he did is that he brought up research on how um, health issues affect the workplace and pretty much affects the bottom line in companies. And uh, the, the, the research is amazing. But what I want to bring out in this is, okay, um, in, the, in this picture, let me get my, my arrow up. In this picture, you can see that cancers, all kinds of cancers cause all kinds of problems and they can affect the bottom line. Cancer being number one, obviously it affects, it has the greatest impact on the, on the health of, and on the, the pocketbooks of the company. Down here, obviously, is depression. It, has a, it doesn't have as great an impact. But let's look at the other slide. When they added absenteeism plus presenteeism, in other words, you're there but you're not fully functional, they found out that by far depression had the greatest impact on the bottom line. So this is very, very, very important uh, that we look at this a lot closely, a lot more closely than we have. And I'm, again, I'm glad we have an expert to come and show us what that is. We do have a series of, of uh, on prevention and everything from cancer to depression to uh, to dentistry and all that and that's also available on our site okay let's move on to why we are here and I'm going to read uh, Dr. Gary's uh, uh, bio out for you and then I'll hand over to him shortly and I okay all right and Dr. and he says he's ready okay 
Dr. Moak is a geriatric psychiatrist in Westboro, Massachusetts. I hope I got that right. And a past president of the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry. He is associate professor of clinical psychiatry at the University of Massachusetts Medical School, where he is involved in geriatric psychiatry teaching and training activities. He is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and attended the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in Piscataway, Piscataway, New Jersey. He then completed his residency in psychiatry and fellowship in geriatric psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh. He is the director of the Moak Center for Healthy Aging in Westboro, Massachusetts, and his website is uh, moakgeriatricpsychiatry.com. The Moak Center provides comprehensive treatment to older adults with late life medical, mental, excuse me, mental health problems, and, he, and it also offers online information about mental health and aging. And I think that's vital that we, we find out what, uh, more about our websites. Dr. Moak, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you for the preparation. Thank you for honoring us with your presence. I'm handing this over to you right now. Uh, good evening. Uh, hopefully everybody can see and hear me well. I want to thank David for that very kind introduction. And I want to thank all of you who are watching this evening for participating in this webinar. I hope that you find it to be a helpful and useful experience. Depression among people of all ages, but older people in particular, is a serious problem. Um, in my opinion, and I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, depression is the single greatest threat to quality of life in old age, and it's certainly a, a big threat to quality of life for people of all ages. The World Health Organization cl classifies depression as the number one leading cause of disability worldwide. To give you an idea of how health authorities begin to be, are beginning to see depression and its seriousness and the impact that it has on people. Now, I chose the title for my talk tonight, Depression and Your Health, What You Don't Know About It Could Kill You. And admittedly, it's a bit dramatic, but uh, the purpose in choosing that title was twofold. First, to emphasize uh, that depression is serious business and it's a serious health problem but also to call attention to the fact that more than just being an emotional and psychological problem that affects mental health and mental well-being, depression has an impact on physical health. And as we learn more and more about this, it's really important for anybody who has depression or cares about someone who has depression to be aware of these factors as well. Uh, now, as I said, uh, I am a geriatric psychiatrist, and the personal and professional perspective that I'll share with you this evening comes from my experience treating older pa uh, patients, mostly people in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and yes, even a few over the age of 100. And yes, those folks sometimes do have psychiatric problems and can benefit from seeing a mental health specialist who understands those problems. But it's also critical to understand that everything that I'm going to say may be as important, if not more important, for younger people who don't have a lot of uh, medical problems yet, but, but who may be vulnerable to depression and may not be getting the treatment they need. For these people, treating depression represents a potentially effective uh, preventive strategy to, to delay or prevent them from getting many of the common health problems that older people live with. Now, depression is a common problem among all people, but it's especially common among older people, those 65 and over. Among this group of people, depression affects about one in five people, at least clinically significant depression does. Among people with various kinds of health problems for whom depression is a complication, it's even a bigger problem. So depression is commonly seen in people who've had a stroke, among those with Alzheimer's disease and related disorders, in Parkinson's disease, and other brain illnesses such as traumatic brain injury, multiple sclerosis, and, and other conditions. And in these conditions, depression may be seen 
in as many as 30 to 50 percent of people affected with these conditions. One difference uh, among older people who have depression compared with younger people is that among older people, depression is more frequently recurrent and more likely to become a chronic persistent condition. And it's this chronic persistent nature that really is so destructive to health in general. So again, late life depression is a huge problem. I said that already, but I really can't say it enough. It's a critical point um, that, that just doesn't, uh, doesn't get appreciated as much as it needs to. It, uh, it can just literally destroy quality of life for older people, but also their family members. Depression exerts a huge burden on family members, and that burden is actually far greater than what's experienced by family members who take care of somebody with Alzheimer's disease or related disorder. The stress, anxiety, pressure, and strain that family members experience is, can be overwhelming and can affect their health as well. So when we, uh, when we think about the depression that affects our older people, our older patients, we really view that as a family disorder because it affects the entire family, including um, caregivers and any other people involved closely in the day-to-day well-being and care of an older person with depression. And certainly depression has an impact on, in the lives of younger people, on their, on their wives, on their children, on their coworkers. So it doesn't just affect the person with depression. Uh, depression is a major contributor to suicide, and one difference among older people is that suicide is much more likely to be caused by depression than it is uh, among older people in which suicide has many other causes and factors. Uh, suicide among teenagers gets a lot of publicity in the lay media, but few people realize that men over the age of 85, particularly white men over the age of 85, have the highest suicide rate of um, uh, any group in the population. So it's a really, really major problem. And depression is associated with significant functional impairment and disability, which as I said, has led the World Health Organization to classify it as the leading cause worldwide of disability. Now, unfortunately, as common and uh, as devastating as this problem is, and as persistent as it is, the majority of older adults with clinically significant depression did not receive treatment for it. Now, there are a whole host of reasons why this is the case, and I'm just going to talk about a few of them now because this is, as you can imagine, very complicated and very nuanced and gets into details of our healthcare system and how it's organized and and a whole lot of things having to do with that and its costs and the like. But one important factor bearing on, on this evening's talk is that older people themselves are often very reluctant to seek or receive any kind of mental health care. They, they um, shy away from going to, um, to, to mental health services. They don't like going to see psychiatrists. And, but, but even when uh, in their primary care doctor's office, the primary care physician identifies that they have depression, makes the diagnosis, recommends a, a treatment for it that can be prescribed and delivered or administered in the primary care setting. Older people remain very reluctant to consent to the treatment. Now, there are a few reasons to, that contribute to these kinds of negative attitudes about depression and its treatment, but um, ultimately, it all comes down to a sense of stigma that um, affects many people when they think about mental health problems, but older people even more so. There's a tendency in our culture uh, among older people, their families, and even their healthcare providers, nurses who work with them, doctors who treat them, to view depression as an expectable, inevitable um, uh, concomitant of getting older. People just assume that when you get older, uh, it's natural to become mentally ill, that um, senility is what happens to you when you get older and being depressed is part of that. There's a tendency to view old age itself as being depressing, uh, to see, to think that there's not much you can do about it, that old people aren't treatable, so that there's no point in treating them, treatment doesn't work. 
And so it leads to an attitude of, you know, you just have to live with it, which is, which is unfortunate because you don't. But the, the net effect is that older people experience mental health problems with a sense of embarrassment, a sense of shame, and a sense of personal failure. They often view it as something they've done, uh, particularly if they've, they've you know, enjoyed good mental health for most of their lives. And most older people with mental health problems have been mentally healthy their whole lives. So they, they find themselves wondering why in my 70s or 80s or even 90s, this is happening now, and sometimes they tend to view it as a personal failure, not trying hard enough, not a good person, not a good parent, not a good grandparent, not maybe not going to church enough, not praying hard enough. And these ideas about aging and mental health make people reluctant to get treatment. The result of this is that among older people with depression, the depression doesn't get treated, and it tends to be much more chronic and much more uh, disabling. Now, few people appreciate that depression doesn't just take a toll on mental health, but it takes a highly significant toll on physical health and is associated with many chronic illnesses that affect people as they get older. They go into their 50s, 60s, 70s, and hopefully beyond that. In, in a general sense, uh, a few comments are appropriate. We know from a lot of research over a long period of time that depression, when it's chronic, is associated with an increased level of sickness. Depressed people have to go to their doctors more often. They have more aches and pains. They have more complaints. They end up taking more medicines. They end up re receiving and requiring more blood tests, more x-rays, more medical tests of other types. They end up being hospitalized much more. Their utilization of healthcare services is much greater and at a much greater toll on them in terms of maybe getting unnecessary tests, taking medicines they don't need, even getting surgery that might have been avoidable, and um, that they end up utilizing, and that their cost ends up, uh, their care ends up costing a lot more. They end up spending money for drugs, co-payments for doctor's visits and hospitalizations, but the cost of additional tests, of additional office visits, of additional hospitalizations adds up over the very large number of people that have depression. Depression also, and this is perhaps one of the most tragic consequences of depression, is that among older people, it can be a cause of avoidable entry into long-term care, a nursing home or an assisted living facility. And I see this as a geriatric psychiatrist all the time in my practice. Um, not, I spend some time uh, visiting people in nursing homes and assisted living facilities where, as you might imagine, many experience clinically significant depression that affects their ability to adjust to these settings and um, experience a modicum of quality of life. One of the things that's often apparent is that they result, they, they, they ended up needing the long-term care because of disability that clearly was very related to the depression that they had, and that they have a depression that, that seems to be very treatable. And it's, it's often um, discouraging for me and very sad to see somebody in a nursing home or an assisted living facility who wasn't treated for depression, who had they been treated weeks or months or even years earlier, might have done a lot better. Things might have turned out quite a bit differently for them, and they might not have needed to go into the nursing home or assisted living facility at all. They might still be living at home on their own or with family members. The other thing that's a frightening statistic that people need to be aware of is that chronic depression is associated with a higher death rate. So among older people with depression, if you compare groups of older people who are matched with other groups of older people who are not depressed, and you match them up according to age and overall health and the kinds of medical problems they have and the number and types of medicines they take, so that all things are equal, with the only difference being that some have depression and some that don't, the people that don't have depression live longer and don't die as frequently as people who are who, who are who have depression. Depression can kill you. It's not harmless, not a harmless state of, of uh, not a harmless mental health problem. Now you might wonder, how can depression, uh, which is a condition that manifests primarily with emotional, psychological symptoms, other mental symptoms, um, really bring about 
uh, physical illnesses in the body? And the answer to the question is complicated and um, really comes from a rapidly exploding area of medical research. But essentially, it comes down to this, that chronic depression physiologically mimics a state of chronic stress. And we've really learned a lot about the detrimental impact chronic stress has on the body and on health. It's a very destructive, harmful state to be in. Depression essentially is a state of chronic depression physiologically in which the nervous system really is on overdrive. It's just running out of control in a lot of ways. E even among people who have depression that causes them to be slowed down, immobile, inactive, lethargic, parts of their nervous system really are running on overdrive, wreaking havoc throughout the rest of the body. Primarily, this is through the impact of the stress hormones, norepinephrine, or commonly, which is commonly known as adrenaline, and cortisol, and the impact that st the stress response itself has on setting up an in, uh, inflammatory response within the body. So it's primarily direct effect of stress hormones and the effect of the stress of the inflammatory response throughout the body uh, seen in, in chronic depression that brings about many of the detrimental effects on physical health that I'm going to talk about. Now, this picture, um, bear with me a minute here, right here, um, is from the work of Edvard Munch, and many of you may be familiar with it. It's titled The Scream. It's commonly used in mental health presentations like this, uh, to uh, as, a, as a lead into talking about stress and other states of, of emotional angst. Um, what I want to talk about for a few minutes now is the specific effect of the stress hormone cortisol, because in addition to the general stress response and the inflammatory reaction that occurs in chronic depression, chronic depression is associated with elevated levels of the stress hormone cortisol. For those of you who have ever taken prednisone for an illness for a long time, you know some of the harmful effects that steroids can have on the body. Cortisol is essentially the body's own steroid. It's a stress hormone, and it does a number of detrimental effects when its, its levels are elevated over long periods of time, which is what happens in depression. So one of the things it does is while st stress itself and depression itself triggers an inflammatory reaction, cortisol inhibits the cellular um, inflammatory response, and this makes people, uh, people's immune systems weakened and leaves people vulnerable to infection. Elevated cortisol levels also cause sodium and fluid retention, and this may manifest in the kind of swelling that commonly seen, particularly in people's feet and ankles, but also causes an elevation in blood pressure, which in turn creates all kinds of problems throughout the body. Chronically elevated levels of cortisol uh, contribute to osteoporosis and increase the risk of hip fracture and fractures elsewhere in the body. They raise blood sugar levels, and when this goes on long enough, can create a state that looks like diabetes or even becomes diabetes, or in people who have diabetes, the chronically elevated levels of cortisol can exacerbate it. And we'll talk specifically about diabetes in a couple minutes. Elevated levels of cortisol are detrimental to, or to wound healing. So people with, with under stress who have high levels of cortisol or perhaps might be on prednisone don't heal as well. And this creates a risk um, for those who get injured or undergo surgery. And uh, perhaps most importantly, and something that I think about in my professional work quite a bit, is that chronic depression through elevated levels of cortisol feeds back and impairs brain function in a couple of ways we'll talk about later um, in this evening's webinar. Let's start by focusing on the immune system. So, um, this picture shows you an electron um, microscopic picture of blood cells. And these uh, red ones that look like puffy red jelly donuts are red blood cells. And this white snowball thing that looks like a hostess um, snowball, for those of you old enough to remember those things, is a white blood cell, uh, many types of which are primarily involved in the cellular immune response. So when you, you're infected, 
with a virus or a bacteria, primarily bacteria, it's, it's these guys that respond to the presence of infection and rush to the source of the infection, creating an inflammatory reaction and fighting the infection off. Chronic stress and chronic depression damage the immune system's response and create a state of, as I said earlier, um, chronic, chronically elevated circulating chemical immune mediators, but they weaken or suppress the cellular immune response. So you get a state of, of increased inf inflammation, but decreased ability to fight infections. And at the same time, uh, an increase in allergic type symptoms. So, so things like uh, rashes like eczema, uh, asthma, and uh, allergic type symptoms like uh, rhinitis or ru inflamed runny nose may be seen more commonly. Now let's, so let's talk about these immune changes in health. So again, there is a negative impact on cellular immunity and that leaves people who are chronically depressed more vulnerable to infection and less able to fight infection when they get it. But at the same time, there's an increase in chemical inflammatory agents that circulate throughout the entire body. These are, many of these are known as cytokines. And while they're necessary and critical to respond to um, breaches of, of, of the body's integrity, they're not meant to be elevated all the time. So when they're cruising around throughout the body all the time, they really can do quite a bit of damage and lead to a higher rate of conditions like arthritis or, or worsening of arthritis. So one of the things that I, I see commonly in practice are people who have osteoarthritis or maybe rheumatoid arthritis, which tends to affect people a little bit younger, who become depressed they experience an increase in arthritic pain. They experience an increase in arthritic um, limitation of range of motion. And they are more functionally impaired. They're less able to, to manage, less able to get around. Uh, their arthritis just becomes much more miserable and it exacts a much greater toll on them. And remarkably, when they get treated for the depression and get them on effective treatment that works and the depression begins to get better, one of the things that occurs concomitantly, sometimes even before the depression itself get, gets better, is they start to notice the arthritis improves. Levels of pain go down, mobility increases, function improves. Really remarkable thing to see. You see it enough, you really, you really appreciate that there's a real connection there. And again, um, these, these, this chronic, uh, chronic state of inflammation throughout the body is really detrimental and does damage to the the arteries throughout the body affecting circulation in the heart, the brain, and elsewhere in ways that, are, that can lead to illnesses in those organs. We'll talk about that in, in a couple minutes. Uh, let's talk specifically about diabetes for a second. Um, this picture is a standard uh, glucometer used by people at home to check their blood sugar. The association between depression and diabetes is very common. One in five people with diabetes, and this cuts across all age groups, not just older people, has clinically significant depression. The relationship between depression and diabetes is a complex one going both ways. So um, diabetes itself can, can cause people to become depressed in a lot of ways that are, that are um, a complicated story in itself, and I, I think more than we can deal with this evening. Um, or make depression worse in people who have it. But um, depression when present in people with diabetes, depression itself can cause diabetes or make diabetes worse in those who suffer from it. This is especially true in untreated, um, milder forms of depression. And that may be because when depression is severe enough, it, it can be disabling enough that people are more likely to end up getting some kind of help. It turns out that some of the, the milder forms of, of depression that are chronic, more insidious, that make people miserable, but don't prevent them from being able to kind of drag themselves through their day-to-day -day lives. They'll go to work, still function as parents, raise their children, take care of their own parents, take care of a, of a spouse, um, that kind of depression. And, and parenthetically, it's the kind of depression we often see among older caregivers who are taking care of a husband or a wife with Alzheimer's disease, or husband or a wife with depression for that matter. 
that this kind of chronic depression, because people live with it, because they get by, because it doesn't it doesn't come to anybody's attention because the primary care physician doesn't pick up on it. It doesn't get treated. And maybe that's why it actually ends up being a more destructive form of depression and more likely to be a factor in diabetes. That's that's speculative. Nobody knows for sure, but um, it, it is one possible explanation for why this would, why milder depression would be a bigger problem. Depression, so as I said before, depression can worsen diabetes. There really are two ways that this happens. The first is that depression makes people bad patients. Um, taking care of yourself is complicated work. It requires effort, attention, motivation, planning, organization. You really have to be thoughtful, whether, whether it's you have lung disease, kidney disease, heart disease or diabetes, taking care of yourself really re requires you to be on the ball and organized. And depression makes it hard for people to do that. Depression makes people apathetic, indifferent, unable to cope, unmotivated. So people with diabetes who have depression uh, often don't take good care of their diabetes. They don't eat properly. They don't exercise. They eat the wrong things. They don't take their, their diabetes medicine the way it's prescribed. They may get lax with their insulin. They may get careless and injected incorrectly. So all of those things can contribute to their diabetes being more out of control. But even among those who somehow, despite depression, uh, manage to take very good care of their diabetes, they're meticulous about their care, and their blood sugar, their, their treatment is spot on with what their diabetes specialist or primary doctor, care doctor has prescribed. Um, their depression, nevertheless, makes their diabetes harder to treat, harder to control. We see this all the time. Depressed diabetics have sugars that are going up and down into the three to 400 range and then, and then down plummeting into the 40 or 50 range. The diabetic specialists are changing their medicine all the time. They just don't seem to be able to get it right. Um, this may be, despite the best treatment, because of the direct physiologic effects that stress hormones and inflammation has on the hormonal systems that are responsible for maintaining normal blood sugar. It's, it's complicated. We don't have all the answers, and there's a lot of research still going on in this area, but the connection is pretty clear cut. The impact of this is that among diabetics, who need to take care of themselves to avoid some of the serious complications that occur, um, the, the effects on vision, ultimately leading to blindness, the effects on the heart, ultimately leading to heart disease, the effects on kidneys, causing chronic kidney disease, and maybe eventually uh, loss of kidney functions and the need for dialysis, the effects on, on peripheral nerves, causing painful neuropathies with which people suffer tremendously. And by the way, when they become depressed, pain from neuropathy becomes much worse. And with treatment of depression, pain from neuropathy gets better. So there's another example of the impact depression has on physical problems. But all these complications, um, including for that matter, peripheral circulation, so problems that lead people to eventually have problems with their feet, to have sores that won't heal, and eventually may lead to them having to have toes amputated or part of their, their foot amputated, these complications are all much, much more common among diabetic people who have depression. And interestingly enough, treatment of depression, when it's successful, lowers these risks. Most alarming is that among people with diabetes who have depression, their risk of dying from any cause at all goes up almost two times. And um, based on some very interesting studies looking at treatment of depression of older people in primary care settings, treatment of depression among those with diabetes um, successfully lowers the chance of dying halfway, by half. It cuts your, your risk of dying by half, which is a, a pretty amazing outcome for psychiatric treatment. Let's turn to the cardiovascular system. So this picture is a picture from an arteriogram of a heart. So what you see here is the body of the heart. And um, these uh, images are artificially colorized, but these bright um, white squiggly lines throughout the picture represent the coronary arteries and all the, all the tributaries that come off them. The coronary arteries 
represent the arterial blood supply that nourishes and feeds the heart. So it's what the heart needs to function properly. And many heart diseases result because um, problems in the circulation in these arteries, problems in the circulation of the heart, leads the heart to not get the blood supply that it needs. And it begins to fail in a lot of ways that lead to various um, uh, heart diseases. You can imagine, you know, if you think about how does, how does the brain um, affect function throughout the body physically, you think about the mind-body connection for a moment, I think you'll appreciate that the brain through the nervous system is closely wired up to all the organs of the body and communicates with all the organs closely and tightly regulates those or organs. So there isn't an organ system in the body that doesn't have some impact, it doesn't have some input from the brain, it isn't to some extent controlled by the brain, more or less. The heart is one of those organs that's very, very intimately controlled by the brain. It's, as you, if you think about it for a minute, it's wired for very close, immediate, rapid response to changing demands on, on, on the person. So if you're um, headed to work, and you're walking toward the bus stop and suddenly you realize that you're running a bit late and the bus is about to pull out and you begin to feel nervous and worried, especially because your, 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 your boss has been after you for showing up late and you have to give a presentation that morning. So you're gonna be in a lot of trouble if you, you become late. You start to feel nervous and stressed out. And then you decide to run for it. When that happens, two, a few things need to happen. Your, your heart needs to, needs to beat faster so that you get the circulation you need so that your legs can carry you while you sprint for the bus. Your blood pressure needs to go up a little bit and your heart needs to be able to respond immediately to those demands that um, the brain is calling uh, uh, on it for. Now, in order to do that, in order to respond so quickly, the heart has, has a feature called beat-to-beat -beat variability, which means that in, any, in healthy, normal people, even who have a very regular pulse rate, so if you feel your pulse and you don't have heart, heart uh, problems, your pulse will probably feel very steady and regularly. But if we analyze that pulse with a computer, what we see is each beat, the interval between each beat is, there, is a little bit different, and that, that difference changes from beat to beat. That variability is considered a, an indicator of heart health. And what's seen in people with depression is that there is a dramatic loss of this variability, what's, what's known medically as beat-to-beat -beat variability. And that loss of beat-to-beat -beat variability, when seen in people with heart diseases, is viewed by cardiologists as a sign of a sick heart. So depression causes changes in the heart rhythm that in cardiac patients, cardiologists see as a sign of heart sickness. Now, let's talk about the specific physiologic effects beyond that that depression uh, exerts on the cardiovascular system. So I mentioned already that we, in, in depression, we have elevated levels of the stress hormones, norepinephrine and cortisol. Norepinephrine causes uh, an increase in pulse rate and blood pressure, which uh, it, it can be tough for the heart. But chronically elevated levels of um, norepinephrine destabilizes the heart electrically. And that means that in people who have lost beat-to-beat -beat variability, chronically elevated levels of norepinephrine can make them more vulnerable to abnormal electrical rhythms in the heart that can ultimately lead under the right circumstances to a cardiac arrest, to suddenly dropping dead, where you, you need to be resuscitated either with a defibrillator or with CPR. And that is thought to be one of the mechanisms by which having depression chronically makes people more prone to sudden cardiac death, dying of a cardiac arrest. As I mentioned earlier, both uh, elevated levels of norepinephrine and cortisol bring about an, an increase in blood pressure, and this is bad for the heart, and um, it, you know, it means that the heart has to do more work. And then finally, one of the things that happens in depression, we'll talk about this more when we talk about stroke, is that depression makes the blood platelets more prone to clot. One of the things that happens in a heart attack 
is and if you if you've been look watching many of the TV commercials for antiplatelet agents that are out there you know that um, many of the some of the ways these medicines work is by preventing some of the clots that can cause heart attacks well depression makes those clots more prone to occur because when people are depressed their platelets are stickier more prone to clump together forming clots in places where you don't want clots to occur like in the coronary arteries so what's the association between depression and heart disease well people who are depressed have a higher rate of coronary artery disease it may be because that chronic state of inflammation causes inflammation in the coronary arteries and then because their platelets are sticky their platelets are more prone to clot in these inflamed coronary arteries forming clots that cause heart attacks or lead to heart attacks uh, and heart failure we know that in people who have congestive heart failure those who become depressed and depression is very common among people with congestive heart failure those who become depressed have worse results. Their, their heart failure becomes worse, it becomes harder to treat, it becomes more disabling, and um, the outcomes are worse. They're, they're more prone to heart attack, they're more prone to developing fluid in their lungs and needing to be hospitalized, and they're more prone to dying as a result of congestive heart failure. Um, depression increases the risk of having a heart attack, and among people who have had a heart attack, and about 40% of people who have had a heart attack will develop clinically significant depression in the aftermath of a heart attack. So among those who have had a heart attack, the presence of depression increases their chance of dying after a heart attack four times compared to people with the same heart attack, the same health in every other way, but who are simply not depressed. And very importantly, a lot of studies show this, that, that treating depression in people after a heart attack with, with an effective treatment, which can, be, which can be counseling or psychotherapy or antidepressant medicine, reduces that increased risk of dying after a heart attack. So that's a, a critical impact, again, of a psychiatric treatment making a difference in terms of physical health. All right, so we'll turn from the cardiovascular system to the respiratory system. And um, what you've got in this picture is basically standard garden variety chest x-ray. Don't know whether this person is depressed or not, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what we're looking at here. Um, many of you may have seen a chest x-ray before, but some of you may be unfamiliar with it. So uh, outlined here, um, in this big white thing in the middle is the heart, and up here are the shoulders, and these white things across the way are the ribs and these dark spaces are where the lungs are and they're dark because the space is mostly filled up with air as it would be in a healthy person so depression has an impact on respiratory function and is associated with greater respiratory problems um, as I said the, the, the brain is connected it's wired up to all the organs of the body it just as the brain is intimately connected to the heart and tightly controls its function the brain is nearly as closely connected to, to the lungs and controls breathing function primarily through um, uh, nerves that control the degree of openness or constriction of the air passages that uh, are critical to, to breathing um, so under states of stress uh, people's airways may become more tightly constricted and those who who suffer from chronic illnesses will tell you that when they feel stressed out they have more trouble breathing chronic stress uh, again also creates a state of chronic inflammation and as many of you may know also from many of the the tv commercials that are currently um, out there now about new new breathing treatments that breathing treatments work not only by dilating the airways and opening them up but by reducing stress uh, reducing inflammation that causes the airways to constrict so chronic depression not only causes airway constriction directly but state but sets up a state in which the airways are more inflamed and therefore more inclined to be constricted so what does that mean in terms of actual respiratory illnesses well, um, people who are depressed are more prone to more frequent asthma attacks. So if you have asthma and you have depression, you're going to have more asthma attacks. Um, 
depression is common among people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease known as COPD and that is a family of diseases that includes includes emphysema chronic bronchitis a condition called uh, bronchiectasis and chronic asthma among people with COPD at least 30 percent of them suffer from concurrent uh, depression which often tends to be chronic um, these depressions tend to be anxious in nature. The patients often feel fretful, overly worried, sad, down in the dumps. Uh, uh, and um, this mood state makes them even more worried about their breathing, more prone to worry about whether they're going to breathe or not, more prone to, to sort of obsess about it. And uh, that, in turn, can, can create a vicious cycle and just make the whole picture worse. Among people with chronic diseases who are depressed, breathing function worsens. So treatment of depression is associated with an, an, an increase in respiratory function. You can breathe better once the depression gets better. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, um, this is a very it's a very dramatic thing to see when it occurs. Um, depression among people with chronic respiratory illness is associated with an accelerated rate of physical deterioration. So people with, with emphysema, chronic bronchitis, eventually can become quite disabled by these conditions. They may end up having to be on, on home oxygen and um, may be shut in in their homes. Having depression makes this kind of thing more likely to happen. So uh, as a, a illness gets worse, uh, the, the disabling manifestations of it uh, are worse, are seen earlier, more debilitating. Let's turn to the kidneys and depression. So um, this picture is a diagram that schematically depicts the mid part of the body from uh, the upper ab the lower abdomen to the pelvis and shows you sitting um, midway in your lower back, uh, two kidneys, one here and one, one here, uh, just, just uh, diagrammatically just so you get an idea. And uh, most of you probably know that the major function of the kidneys is to filter the blood as it circulates down through the body and cleanse it of urea and other impurities that become dissolved in the urine, which then trickles down into the bladder where it's kept until it's voided. And uh, that's just the normal physiologic function. Uh, depression can have an impact on kidney function and kidney diseases. So, Depression is very common among people with, with chronic kidney disease. Among those who have chronic kidney disease, uh, one in five have clinically significant um, depression. And if we look at people who, have, who are living with chronic disease, who um, are, are able to take care of it at home with diet, maybe medicine, who don't yet need dialysis, may be a long way from needing dialysis, depression has an impact on those folks. It, in, it, it like it does in cardiac disease and in stroke, it increases their chance of dying, it increases their rate of hospitalization, and it increases the chance that they're going to need dialysis sooner rather than later. So here again, an impact of depression, very tangible impact on health. If you have kidney disease and you're depressed, the depression makes you more likely to end up needing dialysis rather than being able to successfully avoid it. Not everybody with chronic dis kidney disease ends up needing dialysis, so this may make a, a huge impact on someone's life. If you have, if you're on dialysis already, if you reach the point of advanced, or what's sometimes called, or it's called end-stage kidney disease, and you're on dialysis, having depression increases the rate of needing to be hospitalized for a whole host of reasons and it increases the death rate among those patients. So again, another example of an illness in which being depressed makes people more prone to die. Now we'll talk about stroke, um, which is something that I deal with in my practice quite a bit. So let me first orient you to this picture, which is an MRI scan of the brain. So let's orient you to what you're looking at. I want you to imagine for a minute a big tree in the forest and a, a lumberjack comes and cuts it down. And then you can walk up to the stump and look down on the cut surface of the stump so you can see the, the, the rings of the tree. Now imagine that somebody's head is like um, the tree trunk and with the MRI scanner, which is a computer program that uses magnetic 
uh, mag magnetic signals to create um, computerized images that essentially give us cut or sliced pictures of parts of the body. We've now cut the person's head the way the way the, the lumberjack cut across the tree trunk. So now we're we've got a slice of the head that we can see. We can look down on it and see this this part of the brain substance. So uh, up up here is the forehead. Back here is the back of the head. The ears would be right about here. And on this side of the brain, which you could see, uh, it looks pretty normal. Um, in, in these MRI pictures, the white matter is darker and the gray matter is lighter. But on this side, what we see is something that doesn't belong there. This, this sort of squiggly white stuff represents a stroke. So um, this is what uh, neurologists, radiologists, and sometimes even people like me, geriatric psychiatrists, look for when we're looking at MRI scans to try to understand whether somebody's had a stroke and whether that can account for the problems that we're, we've been asked to, uh, to treat. So let's talk about depression and stroke because that's a complicated relationship. So as I said earlier, one part of the equation is that depression can increase the risk of having a stroke. Um, just like it increases the risk of having a heart attack, it can increase the risk of having a stroke because it does a number of things that are detrimental and uh, to the circulation in the head. It creates a state of chronic inflammation in the blood vessels, which makes them more vulnerable to clots forming at the sites of inflammation. It causes the platelets to be more prone to clotting. So we have a state where people are more vulnerable to clots for a couple of reasons. And then by affecting heart rhythm, um, as I described before, it can make people prone to having a disturbance in heart rhythm, which can cause a clot to, to, to dislodge in the heart and then flow upstream in the circulation into the head where it can cause a stroke. So um, depression is a risk for stroke and it's a, it's a modifiable or treatable risk factor. If you have depression, and you're at risk for having a stroke, treating the depression lowers your chance of having a stroke. Now, more likely, uh, someone like myself, a geriatric psychiatrist, gets involved after somebody has a stroke and they've developed clinically significant depression. And that happens quite often. We call it post-stroke depression. It's seen in about 40% of people after a stroke within one to two years of the strokes occurring. Sometimes it starts within days of the stroke. Sometimes it takes months or longer before we see it, but it is seen in about 40% of people after a stroke. It's not just because it's depressing to have a stroke. Very good studies have looked at other illnesses that are similarly and equally disabling or similarly and equally life-threatening and life-changing. And what we've learned is that uh, stroke causes depression much more than other, other illnesses that have a similar impact on people's lives and well-being and health. It turns out, actually, that where the stroke occurs uh, predicts the likelihood of having depression, and that may have to do with the fact that strokes disrupt certain critical circuits in the brain that are, that are essential for normal uh, mental and emotional functioning and emotional health. So, it's a direct neurologic effect of the stroke. It's, simply, it's not just a, a reaction to having a stroke, which certainly is an upsetting experience. If you've had a stroke and you develop a post-stroke depression, the post-stroke depression makes everything that much worse. So um, the presence of a depression limits recovery after a stroke. It's a, it's a risk factor for poor or un, inadequate rehab. So if you, you go into a rehab setting, and look at people that have had a stroke and speak with the rehab specialists about what they would predict about the, the degree and rate of recovery. Those who don't have depression typically recover um, as predicted and prognosticated by the rehab specialists. Those who have depression don't recover as fast or as much. And that can make a huge difference. It really can, can make a stroke from a bad experience to a horrible experience. It can make that difference and treating it can reverse that. Um, depression after a stroke is associated with greater cognitive impairment. So most people think of a stroke in terms of its manifestations 
um, as including difficulty speaking, weakness or paralysis on one side of the body, numbness or loss of feeling on one side of the body. But among older people that have a stroke, mental or cognitive symptoms are much more common. Now that certainly includes language difficulties, difficulty speaking, but it may include difficulty comprehending what other people are saying, and it may include forgetfulness uh, to the extent that strokes can sometimes cause a pattern that may be mistaken for Alzheimer's disease. Strokes can also impact ability to re remember how to do familiar things, ability to remember what things are for, recognize familiar objects, recognize familiar people, uh, to know, recognize what parts of the, how parts of the body work, and it may affect the ability to act and behave in an organized, goal-oriented manner, to, to sort of be organized and planful. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were talking about diabetes, that's just critical for being able to take care of yourself. And these kinds of cognitive deficits that can occur after a stroke are made much worse by depression. And conversely, treatment of depression in people after stroke brings about a very, very clear improvement in, in cognitive functioning, in memory, and these other intellectual abilities. Depression, once again, depression after a stroke increases the chance of dying and effective treatment lessens this. So one more example of where treating depression helps reduce the rate of death uh, for, um, from a, a, a physical illness. Now we've been talking about platelets, so here's one more microscopic picture of blood cells, just so I can kind of uh, reinforce this idea one more time. So in this picture, uh, these pinkish red circles that look like sort of donuts are the red blood cells and this darker uh, these darker specks represent the platelets the clotting agents and what you could see here in this slide which is a, a blood smear sitting on a glass slide covered by another glass slide is that just the presence of the glass alone is enough to cause the platelets to start clumping into clots so you can imagine what that means in a, an artery in the head or an artery in the heart that's inflamed from, from months and months or years and years of depression, that these, these platelets are, are starting to clot where they, they shouldn't be clotting. What's important to realize is that this function may be mediated by the neurotransmitter serotonin, which is affected in depression, and that a number of very interesting studies looking just at platelets alone have shown that if you, you look at platelets in a test tube and put antidepressants in, that antidepressants can reduce this tendency for platelets to clot more. So there's something about antidepressants and serotonin that can make a difference in platelet clotting, even independent of how these medicines work to treat depression. So the, the, the impact in terms of reducing a chance of a stroke can be huge. Now let's talk about the impact chronic depression has feeding back on the brain because that's also a concern. I see lots of older people, uh, sometimes their family members, who are very concerned about their faculty slipping as they get older. And one of the most common questions that I get in my practice is what can we do to prevent that from happening or slow it down? And that's a, that's a topic for a separate webinar. It's a lengthy, complicated discussion. There are some things you can do. But the point is, treating depression is one of those things. And, and this is where the, the issue of stigma and negative attitudes become so frustrating because people will do all kinds of things if they think it will help them stay sharp as they get older. But if you tell them taking care of your depression is one of them, that it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't it doesn't you know hit home they they just don't off too often more often than not and too often they they just don't want to go ahead and get the treatment that would make a difference for them help them not be depressed but also help them preserve their mental health longer let's look at this impact the scary thing that we've learned uh, through research over the last 10 to 15 years and we're learning more and more about it all the time is that chronic depression leads to shrinkage of a critical area in the brain called the hippocampus. Coincidentally, it's the hippocampus that is often earliest affected in Alzheimer's disease and is the area that accounts for the forgetfulness and other kinds of short-term memory problems that in many cases are the first symptoms 
that appear in Alzheimer's disease. Now, Alzheimer's is a disease that causes the whole brain to shrink, but it starts with the hippocampus. Chronic depression is a disease that can cause the hippocampus to shrink in a way that resembles what we see in Alzheimer's disease. That's, that's a scary finding that ought, to make, that ought to be a wake up call for many people. Uh, we think that uh, this is another example of the impact that, that chronically elevated stress hormones, particularly cortisol, have on the brain. But elevations of these stress hormones in depression result in a suppression of another hormone in the nervous system called BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. BDNF is essential for normal mental and emotional health. It's a hormone that's accountable, that, that causes new brain cells to sprout. No matter how old you get, even among people in their 90s and 100s, in certain areas of the brain, new brain cells are sprouting all the time, and that sprouting of new brain cells is essential to normal mental and emotional health. The other thing that happens all the time, even in areas where new brain cells are sprouting, is that brain cells are constantly modifying their connections with other brain cells. So the brain prunes certain connections that aren't needed anymore, and it sprouts other connections, make new connections, or it strengthens those connections so they, con they convey information better and more reliably and faster. BDNF is necessary for this. And in one of the things that happens in depression is that levels of BDNF drop dramatically. And when that happens, this sprouting, pruning, and, and rewiring of the brain that's essential for good mental health doesn't occur. The brain becomes very stagnant and many areas the hippocampus earliest and most dramatically begin to shrink in a, in a way that's worrisome. Now, interestingly enough, you can, do a, you can do a number of things to raise your BDNF levels. So research tells us that exercise is one good thing for your brain, and it, it may be good for your brain in a lot of ways, but one of the things that exercise does is it raises BDNF levels. Similarly, calorie restriction, eating less, is good for your brain. It's not just good for your heart and your blood pressure and, and the like, it's good for your brain. And one of the ways it's good for your brain, there are many, but one of the ways is that eating less brings about an increased level of BDNF. Now here's a comment, a comment for middle-aged folks. Uh, some, some very good compelling research done over the last five years has looked at the connection between how much you weigh in middle age and how you're doing cognitively when you get older. And the results are kind of alarming. Um, these studies show that people who are overweight in middle age, in, in their 50s and early 60s, have more memory impairment and more difficulty cognitively when they're older. Uh, and this, this doesn't include people who get demented. So these are people who don't have Alzheimer's, don't have other forms of related disorders who are who are normal according to what neurologists would consider normal. They function okay, they drive, they go to the bank, they take care of business, they can cook, but they're just not as sharp as uh, people who weighed less and were closer to their ideal body weight when they were in middle age. So if, if, you've, got, if you've got 10 or 15 pounds to lose, and you're having a hard time convincing yourself to, to make the effort to do it, this is one compelling reason to think about um, losing weight, exercising and losing weight. Interestingly enough, curcumin, the, the ingredient in the spice turmeric, may actually also raise uh, BDNF levels. And there has been some research looking at turmeric as a preventive agent in Alzheimer's disease. And it may be that part of the way this works is by raising BDNF levels. Now, it turns out that treatments for depression, uh, medicine for depression, and electroconvulsive therapy, what's commonly known as shock treatment. Yes, we, we still occasionally use it in, in a limited number of very severe cases where uh, people are not responding to other forms of treatment. And it actually works better for older people. It may be a better treatment for older people and safer for them than it is for younger people. Um, treatments for depression also bring about an elevation of BDF level and, and pretty much restore BDNF levels to normal, and that may be part of how treatments for depression actually make depression better. Um, so the take-home message 
uh, for this chunk of information is that untreated depression can be a cause of preventable memory impairment and brain damage in later life, and, and treatment can prevent that from happening. Now, I told you I was going to show you some pictures of uh, the shrinkage of the hippocampus, so let's, let's do that now. This is another MRI scan um, taken from a different perspective, so let me orient you here. Rather than think about the person's head as a tree trunk, I'd like you to think about it instead as a loaf of bread sliced from front to back. And if you take the loaf of bread and take out a slice and then look at the sliced cut surface, this is what we would see. So we're looking at the brain. Here's the, here's the top of the head. Uh, this is the area of the mouth and nose and, and sinus cavities. Um, uh, the ears would be here and here. And we're looking at it right, right around where the ears are, with the brain cut from top to bottom uh, crosswise. And what you could see is a, a, this is a, a pretty normal looking brain, uh, very healthy, no real shrinkage. But in these two rectangles, you could see uh, what's boxed in are, uh, is the hippocampus on each side, here and here. And what you could appreciate is that compared to the surrounding brain substance, this, the hippocampus is darker, meaning that the brain substance there is less dense. It's thinned out already. It's shrunken. The, the physical size isn't necessarily smaller, but the brain itself is thinner because there are fewer brain cells present. Now, um, an evolving area of research in Alzheimer's disease is beginning to use MRI scans and other tools to identify people early before they have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease to look for this kind of shrinkage in their hippocampus. And what we've learned now is that people with chronic depression get the same kind of shrinkage in their hippocampus. It's hard to distinguish it from what you see in Alzheimer's disease. Now in this next slide, uh, which is a picture, uh, a, a diagram I've put here just to sort of give you a more horrified experience of this, what you have here on the left is, is a, a picture of a pretty healthy brain. And what you have on the right in comparison is the brain of somebody with severe Alzheimer's disease. And it gives you a sense of just how shrunken and shriveled up it gets. Now, in this healthy brain, you can see here, this is the hippocampus to give you an idea of what a normal hippocampus should look like. And now over here, you see this very shrunken, shriveled up hippocampus. And so that should really, anybody that looks at that and realizes that depression can bring us about a state that can do this to this critical area of the brain should really, um, this should just should really scare you or if you're, if you're concerned about somebody you care about who has depression, this should be a compelling reason for you to really try harder to get them to get the treatment that they need. I'm going to summarize my talk about illnesses and depression, just, just highlighting a num number of other areas. Depression has an impact on skin disorders. So um, people, psoriasis sufferers, will have more problems with psoriasis outbreaks, with rashes that are harder to control when they're depressed. Uh, acne is less of a problem for older people, but depression can make acne worse. Um, it can, it can be associated with a wide range of uncomfortable, unpleasant rashes, and depression can be associated with alopecia, loss of hair, and which can be a distressing uh, manifestation of the aging process. So this isn't, this isn't life and death kind of stuff, but if you're getting older and worried about your hair thinning and you have depression, depression may make it fall out faster. And once again, treating depression can reverse these effects. Depression also has a very clear impact on gastrointestinal illnesses. So some of the illnesses that are clearly impacted by depression are Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, which is a very common condition, and peptic ulcer disease. People that have these conditions have a high rate of depression. Among those with depression, these conditions get worse. And in turn, treating the depression often brings about not only an improvement in mental and emotional well-being, but an improvement in gastrointestinal well-being. Other miscellaneous detrimental effects of, of depression on physical health. In older people, chronic depression is associated with a loss of muscle mass. So if you're worried about becoming more frail, becoming weaker, and you're depressed, you're going to lose muscle mass even faster. 
As I said in the beginning of the talk, it's associated with osteoporosis, and that becomes a risk for hip fractures and other fractures. And depression is associated with poor wound healing. So having depression is a risk factor for surgical complications after an operation. So in summary, um, depression has numerous detrimental effects on the body physically. It affects the hormonal, immune, cardiovascular, respiratory, urinary, and neurologic functioning of the body. It causes or worsens serious illnesses like heart disease, stroke, uh, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, immune problems, and brain functioning, including memory functioning in a way that uh, actually closely resembles what's seen in early Alzheimer's disease. Depression is more than just a source of emotional misery. It's bad for your health physically. Now, many people, as I said in the beginning, remain uh, unfortunately locked in and imprisoned by depression. I put this uh, get out of jail free cartoon uh, card from the board game Monopoly here as a way to emphasize the point that depression is treatable. You don't have to suffer with depression and the consequences of depression on health are potentially um, remediable, preventable, or at least can be mitigated. Again, negative attitudes are the major barrier to people getting the treatment they need. Um, views that depression and mental problems are just an inevitable, expectable form of mental illness, which we know is not the case. In fact, sociologists have done some very nice studies that have shown that uh, among older people who stay relatively healthy, don't have to stay healthy, but relatively healthy, levels of happiness actually go up as people get older. Older people tend to be happier than younger people and tend to have a higher level of life satisfaction. There are a lot of reasons for that, and I can maybe, if people are interested, try to answer them during the question and answer session, but you'll take my word for it for, for now that the point here is that depression is just not what happens to you when you get old because you're old. It's a disease state that has to be treated. Uh, we hear in practice all the time um, people's excuse for not having treatment. Uh, basically, they say, well, you know, if you, if you were sick, if you had a stroke, if you had a heart attack, if you had cancer, if you were on dialysis, you'd be depressed too. Well, sure, most people wouldn't like it. They wouldn't be happy about it. They'd be upset about it. But in fact, the, the, vast, the majority of people with these conditions don't get depression. Depression is common, but it doesn't affect half of people with these illnesses. It affects a minority, sometimes as much as 40%, but, but not everybody. It's, it's, a, it's a complication or a comorbid or separate illness that makes other illnesses worse, but it's not simply an expectable, inevitable reaction to those illnesses. It needs to be treated. People tend to apply a grin and bear it attitude. If you've made it to your 80s or 90s, you've gotten through a lot of difficulties in life, you've learned to sort of uh, uh, deal with, with significant hardships, with life difficulties, with stress, with illness, with losses, and you've come through that and you've, you've, you've come to learn that you can rely on your ability to cope and you still expect yourself to be able to do that. Not being, not recognizing that aging can create circumstances physically in the brain that make people who have had good mental health before prone to get depressed now that they're older. Grinning and bear it uh, as an attitude and strategy is something that people can sometimes get by with. The fact that so many people live with chronic depression month after month, year after year, attests to that. But you have to keep in mind that depression is not good for you. It's killing you and it's treatable. Treatment of depression works no matter how old you are. So views that old people don't get better, they don't respond to treatment are just incorrect and have to be dispelled. Old people respond to treatment for depression extremely well. Treatment of older people, especially if they're very old in their 90s or very sick or very frail is more complicated and therefore it requires in many cases a higher level of expertise. You, need to, you may need to see a specialist but doesn't mean it's not treated. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, most older people with clinically significant depression 
never receive any treatment for it. Among those who get any kind of treatment at all, most of the treatment they receive turns out to be ineffective. There are a lot of reasons for that. It's a complicated story, but we see, uh, and actually the government uh, has done a lot of studies looking at this, uh, that there are many people receiving a treatment for depression that they take faithfully and hasn't done them a bit of good. So in fact, um, the, it's the worst of both worlds because they've received a treatment that they maybe they're paying for, somebody's paying for them that, for it that hasn't helped, and the depression they have hasn't gotten any better. So that's really a shame, and, and healthcare planners are looking at ways to try to uh, improve the treatment of depression among people of all ages, but among older people in particular. It's critical that there's a critical role for advocacy. So if you're watching this because you're concerned about somebody you care about that has depression, it's critical that you advocate for them at several levels. First, with them themselves, you, you have to be a positive voice to overcome some of the, the, the negative attitudes and foot dragging about getting treatment. When they go for treatment, you have to push their healthcare providers to recognize the problem, diagnose it correctly, and tr start treatment, and then follow up and, and make sure the treatment is effective. It's not good enough to start a low dose of an antidepressant and say, come back in six months. It's critical that after treatment is started, people are seen back very quickly, within a week or two, to see how they're doing, make sure the medicine agrees with them, that they're not having any side effects to answer their questions, and adjust it accordingly until the treatment starts to work or to change the treatment until a treatment that does work is found, or to refer the person to a specialist when treatment isn't working. Uh, people themselves sometimes need to advocate along these lines, insisting that they get the treatment they need and demanding a referral to a specialist if it's not happening. So advocacy is critical. Educated consumers make a difference. So the take home messages from this talk for this evening is Depression is not just a mental and emotional condition that makes life miserable, but which you can tough it out and live with. Depression is destructive to physical health, um, and it's bad for you. It, um, it leads to all kinds of illnesses, increases the chance of being hospitalized, and increases the chance of dying at any age for any reason. Treatment lessens all of these impacts of depression, um, and it works, but uh, treatment often um, isn't available or delivered to older people with depression, and even when they get it, the treatment they get isn't effective. So for, for treatment of depression to have a positive impact on health, good treatment is needed. All right, so we're at the end of, of the talk and my slides. In a minute or two, we're going to open this up to the question and answer period. I don't know that we'll be able to answer everybody's questions this evening, although we'll, we'll do the best we can. Um, I think that uh, questions will be posted on um, the uh, Building uh, Strength web, uh, webinars website, and we'll try to answer some of them there. I also want to let you know that I have a website, and you're welcome to contact me there. And I'll try to answer as many questions as I can, but I can't promise to get to all of them. But you may find on that website other interesting, useful information about mental health and aging. And I also want to mention that we publish an online newsletter. And the next three or four issues will have articles that deal with specific aspects of this, this issue of the impact depression has on physical health problems. We'll be treating these issues in, in much greater detail than I was able to do in this short webinar this evening. So with that, I wanna, I wanna thank David for inviting me to speak this evening, for making this webinar possible and for going so smoothly. And um, David will begin to take uh, questions and can do that as long as we have time to do so. Uh, 
I, I don't know what to say uh, this, other than this has been a, a masterful, masterful presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Gary. I, I am live, and it looks like I can still hear you, but um, I will be handing over the questions to you as we go along. So I'm just, I'm just going to do a quick uh, infomercial here, but I'm sending the questions in over to you right now. Hang on. It's funny, I can actually hear Dr. Mo typing away, which should not be happening. Uh, but let's see. Let's see what we can do here. Folks, we will be taking your questions and taking care of them right away, okay? All right. I've, I've sent him a few, so he should be able to see them right now. And I see the questions are coming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Does your brain hurt from all this information? I tell you, I am just... Uh, that's one of the things I love about my job. We just I get, I get exposed to such great information, but also I get expo I get exposed to such amazing people, just <laughs> amazingly brilliant people like Dr. Moak. Uh, this is fantastic, fantastic. Thank you again, uh, folks. Those of you who know people who live in retirement homes, or if you know people who work at retirement homes, I, I mean, I, I'm just I'm listening to this presentation and I'm thinking. Ah, oh, Carrie at this uh, retirement home right there next to me needs to know about this. She's head of activities there. She deals with people with depression all the time. This is a perfect presentation for that, and I'm going to send her a link to this afterwards. By the way, speaking about replays, the replays are going to be available. Uh, uh, we, we will send you a link if you if you actually uh, registered for this. We will make it available. We can you can uh, you can purchase it at a nominal fee. You can also purchase his handouts of those wonderful slides you can purchase that at a nominal nominal fee as well these these are brilliant presentations both uh, dr mooks and dr anibalis that's amazing that's amazing uh so uh just look out in your emails if you registered uh, we'll probably put on the website as well uh what else do i have to talk about i think that's it so uh, if you want to type in your questions go ahead and type them in you can put them on but you can put them on our website also by clicking on the on the banner on our website and putting your comments but please 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 also visit Dr. Moke's website as well he has a lot of great information there and I think again people living in retirement homes people over the age of I mean 60 70 you got to start early and start learning about these things so please spread the word about what is going on Dr. Moke thank you so much I'm sending this back to you Oops. Okay, so um, the first question I have here is um, from somebody who says that she's been suffering from depression and anxiety for most of her life, and for the last two years has been on a combination of the antidepressants Prozac and Celexa, which are both S. Uh, wondering um, about the um, the efficacy or the effectiveness of that combination about the use of other kinds of antidepressants called SNRIs. She is asking about um, the use of supplements such as SAMe and many others. So this is um, a, 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 a good question. It's got a lot of aspects to it. It's complicated. Let me just say it's hard to answer specific questions about an individual's treatment without being having done an evaluation of that person. So my my answers may not be the right answers for you, but, th but I'm going to answer this in general. So your doctors may have a very good reason for putting you on two S SSRI antidepressants at the same time. We, in general, tend to, tr to frown on that practice and try to find one medicine that will work effectively by itself as, a, as an initial strategy. Combinations of antidepressants are used uh, all the time in practice, and I do that myself quite a bit, but I, I don't think I can ever really see uh, a good reason for combining two SSRI antidepressants. More likely, I would combine an SSRI antidepressant with another kind of antidepressant, such as Welbutrin or Remeron, or increasingly with older people, we use some of the psychostimulant drugs that are used to treat ADD in children and, and for that matter, adolescents and adults. There, there doesn't really seem to be, um, in general, good reasons for two SSRI antidepressants. And what I might worry about that is it might create 
too much of an antiplatelet effect, making you or people on enough of these medicines together actually more prone to bleeding. So if you're having frequent nosebleeds, if when you cut yourself, you bleed a very long time, if you're prone to bruising easily, this may be part of the reason that's going on. Supplementing uh, an antidepressant like Celexa with a nutritional supplement like SAMe can be a very valid strategy. Uh, you have to be very careful in using complementary and alternative approaches, some of which don't work and some of which can have as bad side effects, if not worse side effects than medicines. And there are clear examples of people getting into serious difficulties because of interactions of uh, over-the-counter things they take and the prescription medicines they're on. Uh, SAMe is one of those things that actually has been researched quite a bit. And several good studies show that it can be effective in treating depression. And recently, a very good study showed that when it's added to an SSRI antidepressant like Celexa, it can make that antidepressant work better. In older people, I tend uh, to prefer Celexa to Prozac, and many geriatric specialists do, because it's shorter acting and has fewer drug-drug interactions than Prozac does. Prozac's a great drug, and I have no reservations about using it with younger people and do prescribe it for some of my patients who are all elderly, but generally I prefer to use Celexa in those cases. All right, let's see if we have um, another question. So one of the questions, the next question is, what are the symptoms in children? Can antidepressants increase the risk of um, melasma, uh, facial pigmentation? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I am actually going to punt on this question. Being a geriatric psychiatrist, I don't really feel qualified uh, or able to speak about these kinds of issues in children. Uh, I, I, can, I can address them in, in adults, primarily uh, middle age and older adults, but would, would feel a bit uh, uneasy about a question with children. Um, so the next question has to do with, uh, another question having to do with supplements, and it has to do with 5-HT and uh, theanine, which I'm, I'm not quite sure what that is, but the question is whether they're good supplements for depression, and do I have any opinion about transmagnetic uh, stimulation for therapy of treatment refractory depression in somebody who's been depressed for 20 years, which is an awful long time to be depressed. So let me take this um, one step at a time. To reiterate, there, there are some things in terms of complementary and alternative therapies that can be useful for depression. Uh, interestingly enough, exercise can be a helpful strategy for treating mild depression and a good adjunct to treating more serious depression. The problem is when you're depressed, motivation to exercise is often one of the things that goes first, so it can be tough. Um, Sam E has been shown in very good research studies to be somewhat effective, uh, often very effective in some cases. The problem with it is it, it tends to be expensive and it's not covered by insurance. There are very good studies showing that supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids, um, fish oil being a good, a good source of that, uh, can make antidepressants work better. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids can actually be a reasonable treatment for depression uh, by themselves. And in some of the patients that I see who have depression, are interested in treatment, but really don't want to take prescription medicines, sometimes we start with fish oil. In, in um, the, the trick in older people is figuring out how much they can tolerate. And in people with bleeding problems, people who take Coumadin uh, for atrial fibrillation or after a heart attack or stroke, Fish oil can be tricky to use. It needs to be used very cautiously and, and in coordination with the other doctors. Uh, but fish oil is a good possibility. Um, the, uh, the herbal treatment St. John's wort can sometimes work. Uh, it's widely used in European countries where psychiatrists uh, believe strongly that it works. Uh, I sometimes will turn to it and find that it can be helpful. I have patients that, that swear by it. Uh, there is um, there are some people that believe that a supplement, a dietary supplement called acetyl L-carnitine, or Alcar for short, may have some benefit in treating depression in older people. 
uh, to my reading of the, of the medical research literature, that's never been clearly established. So I don't routinely recommend that to my patients. But um, in, again, in some people who, for whom there are no other better options, it's sometimes worth trying, and I have recommended it occasionally. Let's see if I've covered uh, all the bases in terms of complementary and alternative oral therapies. Let's talk about TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. So this is a, a, a new treatment that's been approved by the Food and Drug Administration, but not yet covered by Medicare, which is an issue. TMS involves going for treatments generally four times a week, done in, in a doctor's office, sitting in a chair with your head in a contraption that basically is a magnetic wave generator. So it's a treatment that involves magnetizing, bombarding the brain with, with magnetic waves. It's been shown uh, to uh, help in depression in some studies. It's controversial, though. Uh, the, 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 the data were strong enough that the Food and Drug Administration did approve it, but that mainly has to do with the fact that it's probably a harmless treatment, that there are no serious adverse effects to it. So I don't have any reservations about people having it. If you suffered with depression and nothing else is happening, TMS may be something to try. The, um, the good news is that, again, it's very, very safe for older people. The bad news is it's very time intensive. You have to go four days a week. The treatments take 45 minutes. They're not covered by Medicare, and so that's an out-of-pocket expense. That, that makes it a deal breaker for many older people, particularly people living on a fixed income. Okay. Um, So let's see, my brother committed suicide at age 21. Oh, that's awful. Um, my sister also suffers from depression, and I am uh, just recently noticing that my mother, who is 76 years old, is exhibiting symptoms of depression as well. Would you not say that there is a good possibility that she is also depressed? Uh, she might be. The, the thing we try to do in psychiatry um, more and more is to think about mental health problems as medical problems the way other doctors do. So we try to avoid reacting just to symptoms, but to really diagnose the problem correctly. So in older people, there are many symptoms of depression that are nonspecific, that can be seen in a whole host of other conditions. So people that become unmotivated, uninterested in doing things, don't want to go anywhere, seem sluggish, seem forgetful, aren't eating well, aren't sleeping well, uh, seem sluggish and maybe a bit down, may be depressed, but they could have any uh, of a number of other conditions. They could be in the earliest stages of Alzheimer's disease. They could have frontotemporal dementia. They may have had a small stroke that went unrecognized. Many strokes in older people go unrecognized. We, we discover them only in retrospect, when we look at a CAT scan or an MRI and see evidence that there was a stroke, as we saw in the MRI that I showed you during my slides, um, many of these things go unrecognized as strokes. And people don't know they've even had them. Um, thyroid problems, nutritional deficiencies, uh, diabetes that's not being well controlled, congestive heart failure are all conditions that may cause all of those symptoms and may lead people, patients themselves, their families, sometimes even their doctors, to conclude that someone has depression. That's where the expertise comes in, is really sorting out what's going on, making the diagnosis and prescribing a treatment, but prescribing the right treatment for the right condition. Now, in this case, it's more complicated because when um, uh, it's not uncommon at all to see in geriatric psychiatry practice to see an older person who comes in who's had good mental health their whole lives and now suddenly has depression. And what you, what you find out in the family history is that two or three members of the family also have depression. Depression is, a, is an illness that tends to be familial in the sense that it runs in families. If you have a relative, a parent, a sibling, or in this case, a child with depression, your chance of also getting depression goes up. Now, some people who are older who didn't get depression when they were younger didn't get it because they may not have all the genes their children have. And what's happened is as they've gotten older, factors that have to do with aging and the effect aging has on brain function 
make them more vulnerable to become depressed. So those genes that weren't a problem when they were younger suddenly are a problem now that they're older. Maybe other things going on too. They may have other illnesses that are weighing in. There may be side effects of medicines they're taking for physical problems that may be making them depressed. But the genetics may be taking, having an impact now that they're older for reasons that have to do with aging. And so suddenly, the familial, uh, sort of, it's sort of ironic that it's, it's running in reverse. Rather than children getting an illness that the parents had earlier, the parents is now showing an illness that was first seen in the children. That, that's the reason why that can be. So what I would suggest, especially given your family history, is that it would really be good for your, your mother to get a, a good evaluation for depression, either with her primary care physician or with a specialist familiar with evaluating depression in older people. All right, I hope I, I answered that question. Um, let's see. So my husband takes an antidepressant for depression and a stimulant for right hemisphere learning disability. His doctor has never mentioned B vitamins or omega-3s. Should he? Why is it that depression medicines work well initially and then stop after a while? Boy, I wish I knew the answer to that last part of the question. Uh, this phenomenon, which is sometimes referred to as antidepressant poop out, um, is a commonly observed phenomenon. It doesn't happen all the time. In fact, it happens in a small minority of cases, maybe one in five. Uh, and what, what it's referring to is that people start taking an antidepressant, may take days, weeks, or in older people, sometimes even months to work. They begin to get better. They do get better. They seem, they, they, they're close to back to normal or maybe back to normal, and everything is going great for a couple of months. And then suddenly the medicine seems to wear off. And people, and much, as you can imagine, much of the consternation of these people who thought they were out of the woods and now have to deal with this problem coming back. Um, we don't really know why that happens. It often means uh, we think that it may be that the brain has learned to adapt to the, the presence of the medicine, and sometimes that means the dose has to be increased if that's a viable approach. Sometimes it means that another second medicine for depression needs to be added to broaden the effectiveness of the, of the treatment so that it affects more uh, neurotransmitter systems and therefore more brain circuits involved in depression. We, we just don't know, really know for sure. Interestingly, in a situation like that, one strategy might be to add a psychostimulant type drug to an antidepressant. Other strategies might include adding um, lithium, which is a little harder to do in older people than younger people, thyroid hormones, um, supplements I've mentioned already, uh, certain of the antipsychotic medicines that are now approved by the FDA as adjuncts in treating depression, maybe another medicine for depression. There, there is a whole host of things that we can do, and it's critical to work with somebody who understands those that range of options, can look at the individual, look at the other health problems they have, other medicines they're taking, the symptoms that are most critical to treat, and then arrange the options in an order that makes some sense for them. Uh, you also want to try to uh, avoid the side effects that are likely to be most problematic for some people and try to find treatments that will have fewer side effects or side effects that are going to be more easily tolerated by that particular individual. Um, what about uh, B vitamins and omega-3s? Well, um, one of the things we do as part of the standard evaluation for older people with depression is we check their levels of vitamin B12 and folic acid, which are associated with depression in old age. And we check levels of a chemical called homocysteine, which is often elevated in people with B vitamin deficiencies. Homocysteine was um, checked, was widely checked uh, because it was thought to be associated with cardiovascular disease, and more recent research has kind of put the kibosh on that, so that's no longer done anymore. And primary care physicians often view it as a useless task, but, but we still believe that 
um, in research that suggests that elevated levels of homocysteine in, in older people is associated with depression. And there's some scary research that shows that elevated levels of homocysteine are associated with atrophy of the hippocampus, that, that section that I, I, I talk with you about in those MRI slides. Interestingly enough, B vitamin supplementation may be one way of correcting those elevations and may result in improvement of depression. Um, should um, the provider be talking with you about these things, it really, um, it really depends. It may have uh, done blood tests already to check these levels, um, maybe not. Um, you really need to find out whether that provider is up to date and familiar with this area of research because it's not, it's not at this point mainstream practice for primary care physicians and even for some general psychiatrists. Let's see if there are any other questions. Um, I think we've we've exhausted the questions on the, the screen at this point. And I don't know, David, how much more time we have left at this point. I'm happy to take uh, a couple more if there are additional questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up and say goodnight at this point. Uh, hi. Hello. Um, let me see. Um, I don't appear to know. Um, Nope, I don't see anything remotely suggestive of that. So are, we're we're off at this point. Okay. Okay, so for those of you still with us and watching, uh, you see me talking on the phone with Command Central. We've apparently encountered some uh, technical glitches. And because of that, um, I'm going to close at this point. Once again, I want to thank everybody for joining me this evening. I hope you found this to be a helpful and useful program and worth your time. And we're going to end the program at this point. So good night, everybody. Okay, so um, the first question I have here is um, from somebody who says that she's been suffering from depression and anxiety for most of her life, and for the last two years has been on a combination of the antidepressants Prozac and Celexa, which are both S. Uh, wondering um, about the um, the efficacy or the effectiveness of that combination about the use of other kinds of antidepressants called SNRIs. She is asking about um, the use of supplements such as SAMe and many others. So this is um, a, a, a 
uh, a good question. It's got a lot of aspects to it. It's complicated. Let me just say it's hard to answer specific questions about an individual's treatment without being having done an evaluation of that person. So my my answers may not be the right answers for you, but the, but I'm going to answer this in general. So your doctors may have a very good reason for putting you on two S, SSRI antidepressants at the same time. We in general tend to tr to frown on that practice and try to find one medicine that will work effectively by itself as a, as an initial strategy. Combinations of antidepressants are used uh, all the time in practice, and I do that myself quite a bit. But I, I don't think I can ever really see uh, a good reason for combining two SSRI antidepressants. More likely, I would combine an SSRI antidepressant with another kind of antidepressant, such as Welbutrin or Remeron, or increasingly with older people, we use some of the psychostimulant drugs that are used to treat ADD in children, and, and for that matter, adolescents and adults. There, there doesn't really seem to be, um, in general, good reasons for two SSRI antidepressants. And what I might worry about that is it might create too much of an antiplatelet effect, making you or people on enough of these medicines together actually more prone to bleeding. So if you're having frequent nosebleeds, if when you cut yourself, you bleed a very long time, if you're prone to bruising easily, this may be part of the reason that's going on. Supplementing uh, an antidepressant like Celexa with a nutritional supplement like SAMe can be a very valid strategy. Uh, you have to be very careful in using complementary and alternative approaches, some of which don't work and some of which can have as bad side effects, if not worse side effects, than medicines. And there are clear examples of people getting into serious difficulties because of interactions of uh, over-the-counter things they take and the prescription medicines they're on. Uh, SAMe is one of those things that actually has been researched quite a bit, and several good studies show that it can be effective in treating depression. And recently, a very good study showed that when it's added to an SSRI antidepressant like Celexa, it can make that antidepressant work better. In older people, I tend uh, to prefer Celexa to Prozac, and many geriatric specialists do, because it's shorter acting and has fewer drug-drug interactions than Prozac does. Prozac's a great drug, and I have no reservations about using it with younger people, and do prescribe it for some of my patients who are all elderly, but generally I prefer to use Celexa in those cases. All right, let's see if we have um, another question. So one of the questions, the next question is, what are the symptoms in children? Can antidepressants increase the risk of um, melasma, uh, facial pigmentation? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I am actually going to punt on this question. Being a geriatric psychiatrist, I don't really feel qualified uh, or able to speak about these kinds of issues in children. Uh, I, I, can, I can address them in, in adults, primarily uh, middle age and older adults, but would, would feel a bit uh, uneasy about a question with children. Um, so the next question has to do with, uh, another question having to do with supplements, and it has to do with 5-HT and uh, theanine, which I'm, I'm not quite sure what that is, but the question is whether they're good supplements for depression. And do I have any opinion about transmagnetic uh, stimulation for therapy of treatment refractory depression in somebody who's been depressed for 20 years, which is an awful long time to be depressed? So let me take this um, one step at a time. To reiterate, there, there are some things in terms of complementary and alternative therapies that can be useful for depression. Uh, interestingly enough, exercise can be a helpful strategy for treating mild depression and a good adjunct to treating more serious depression. The problem is when you're depressed, motivation to exercise is often one of the things that goes first, so it can be tough. Um, Sam E has been shown in very good research studies to be somewhat effective, uh, often very effective in some cases, 
The problem with it is it, it tends to be expensive and it's not covered by insurance. There are very good studies showing that supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids, um, fish oil being a good, a good source of that, uh, can make antidepressants work better. But, uh, omega-3 fatty acids can actually be a reasonable treatment for depression uh, by themselves. And in some of the patients that I see who have depression, are interested in treatment, but really don't want to take prescription medicines, sometimes we start with fish oil. In, in um, the, the trick in older people is figuring out how much they can tolerate. And in people with bleeding problems, people who take Coumadin, uh, for atrial fibrillation or after a heart attack or stroke. Fish oil can be tricky to use. It needs to be used very cautiously and, and in coordination with the other doctors. Uh, but fish oil is a good possibility. Um, the, uh, the herbal treatment St. John's wort can sometimes work. Uh, it's widely used in European countries where psychiatrists uh, believe strongly that it works. Uh, I sometimes will turn to it and find that it can be helpful, uh, patients that, that swear by it. Uh, there, is, um, there are some people that believe that a supplement, a dietary supplement called acetyl L-carnitine, or Alcar for short, may have some benefit in treating depression in older people. Uh, to my reading of the, of the medical research literature, that's never been clearly established, so I don't routinely recommend that to my patients. But uh, in, again, in some people who, for whom there are no other better options, it's sometimes worth trying, and I have recommended it occasionally. Let's see if I've covered uh, all the bases in terms of complementary and alternative oral therapies. Let's talk about TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation. So this is a, a, a new treatment that's been approved by the Food and Drug Administration, but not yet covered by Medicare, which is an issue. TMS involves going for treatments, generally four times a week, done in, in a doctor's office, sitting in a chair with your head in a contraption that basically is a magnetic wave generator. So it's a treatment that involves magnetizing, bombarding the brain with, with magnetic waves. It's been shown uh, to uh, help in depression in some studies. It's controversial, though. Uh, the, 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 the data were strong enough that the Food and Drug Administration did approve it, but that mainly has to do with the fact that it's probably a harmless treatment, that there are no serious adverse effects to it. So I don't have any reservations about people having it. If you suffered with depression and nothing else is happening, TMS may be something to try. The, um, the good news is that, again, it's very, very safe for older people. The bad news is it's very time intensive. You have to go four days a week. The treatments take 45 minutes. They're not covered by Medicare, and so that's an out-of-pocket expense. That, that makes it a deal breaker for many older people, particularly people living on a fixed income. Okay. Um, Let's see, my brother committed suicide at age 21. Oh, that's awful. Um, my sister also suffers from depression, and I am uh, just recently noticing that my mother, who is 76 years old, is exhibiting symptoms of depression as well. Would you not say that there is a good possibility that she is also depressed? Uh, she might be. The, the thing we try to do in psychiatry um, more and more is to think about mental health problems as medical problems the way other doctors do. So we try to avoid reacting just to symptoms, but to really diagnose the problem correctly. So in older people, there are many symptoms of depression that are nonspecific, that can be seen in a whole host of other conditions. So people that become unmotivated, uninterested in doing things, don't want to go anywhere, seem sluggish, seem forgetful, aren't eating well, aren't sleeping well, uh, seem sluggish and maybe a bit down, may be depressed, but they could have any uh, of a number of other conditions. They could be in the earlier stages of Alzheimer's disease. They could have frontotemporal dementia. They may have had a small stroke that went unrecognized. Many strokes in older people go unrecognized. We, we discover them only in retrospect, when we look at a CAT scan or an MRI and see evidence that there was a stroke, as we saw in the MRI that I showed you during my slides. 
Um, many of these things go unrecognized as strokes. And people don't know they've even had them. Um, thyroid problems, nutritional deficiencies, uh, diabetes that's not being well controlled, congestive heart failure uh, are all conditions that may cause all of those symptoms and may lead people, patients themselves, their families, sometimes even their doctors, to conclude that someone has depression. That's where the expertise comes in, is really sorting out what's going on, making the diagnosis and prescribing a treatment, but prescribing the right treatment for the right condition. Now, in this case, it's more complicated because when um, uh, it's not uncommon at all to see in geriatric psychiatry practice, to see an older person who comes in, who's had good mental health their whole lives, and now suddenly has depression. And what you, what you find out in the family history is that two or three members of the family also have depression. Depression is, a, is an illness that tends to be familial in the sense that it runs in families. If you have a relative, a parent, a sibling, or in this case, a child with depression, your chance of also getting depression goes up. Now, some people who are older who didn't get depression when they were younger didn't get it because they may not have all the genes their children have. And what's happened is as they've gotten older, factors that have to do with aging and the effect aging has on brain function make them more vulnerable to become depressed. So those genes that weren't a problem when they were younger suddenly are a problem now that they're older. There may be other things going on too. They may have other illnesses that are weighing in. There may be side effects of medicines they're taking for physical problems that may be making them depressed. But the genetics may be taking, having an impact now that they're older for reasons that have to do with aging. And so suddenly the familial, uh, sort of, it's sort of ironic that it's, it's running in reverse. Rather than children getting an illness that the parents had earlier, the parents is now showing an illness that was first seen in the children. And that, that's the reason why that can be. So what I would suggest, especially given your family history, is that it would really be good for your, your mother to get a, a good evaluation for depression, either with her primary care physician or with a specialist familiar with evaluating depression in older people. All right, I hope I, I answered that question. Um, let's see. So my husband takes an antidepressant for depression and a stimulant for right hemisphere learning disability. His doctor has never mentioned B vitamins or omega-3s. Should he? Why is it that depression medicines work well initially and then stop after a while? Boy, I wish I knew the answer to that last part of the question. Uh, this phenomenon, which is sometimes referred to as antidepressant poop out, um, is a commonly observed phenomenon. It doesn't happen all the time. In fact, it happens in a small minority of cases, maybe one in five. Uh, and what, what it's referring to is that people start taking an antidepressant, may take days, weeks, or in older people, sometimes even months to work. They begin to get better. They do get better. They seem, they, they, they're close to back to normal or maybe back to normal and everything is going great for a couple of months. And then suddenly the medicine seems to wear off. And people, and much as you can imagine, much to the consternation of these people who thought they were out of the woods and now have to deal with this problem coming back. Um, we don't really know why that happens. It often means uh, we think that it may be that the brain has learned to adapt to the, the presence of the medicine. And sometimes that means the dose has to be increased if that's a viable approach. Sometimes it means that another second medicine for depression needs to be added to broaden the effectiveness of the, of the treatment so that it affects more uh, neurotransmitter systems and therefore more brain circuits involved in depression. We, we just don't know, really know for sure. Interestingly, in a situation like that, one strategy might be to add a psychostimulant type drug to an antidepressant. Other strategies might include adding um, lithium, which is a little harder to do in older people than younger people thyroid hormones, um, supplements I've mentioned already, uh, certain of the antipsychotic medicines that are now approved by the FDA as adjuncts in treating depression, maybe another medicine for depression. There, there is a whole 
host of things that we can do and it's critical to work with somebody who understands those that range of options can look at the individual look at the other health problems they have other medicines they're taking the symptoms that are most critical to treat and then arrange the options in an order that makes some sense for them uh, you also want to try to uh, avoid the side effects that are likely to be most problematic for some people and try to find treatments that will have fewer side effects or side effects that are going to be more easily tolerated by that particular individual. Um, what about uh, B vitamins and omega-3s? Well, um, one of the things we do as part of the standard evaluation for older people with depression is we check their levels of vitamin B12 and folic acid, which are associated with depression in old age. And we check levels of a chemical called homocysteine, which is often elevated in people with B vitamin deficiencies. Homocysteine was um, checked, was widely checked uh, because it was thought to be associated with cardiovascular disease. And more recent research has kind of put the kibosh on that. So that's no longer done anymore. And primary care physicians often view it as a useless task. But, but we still believe that um, in research that suggests that elevated levels of homocysteine in, in older people is associated with depression. And there's some scary research that shows that elevated levels of homocysteine are associated with atrophy of the hippocampus, that, that section that I, I, I talk with you about in those MRI slides. Interestingly enough, B vitamin supplementation may be one way of correcting those elevations and may result in improvement of depression. Um, should um, the provider be talking with you about these things, it really, um, it really depends. You may have uh, done blood tests already to check these levels, um, maybe not. Um, you really need to find out whether that provider is up to date and familiar with this area of research because it's not it's not at this point mainstream practice for primary care physicians and even for some general psychiatrists let's see if there are any other questions um i think we've we've exhausted the questions on the the screen at this point and i don't know david how much more time we have left at this point i'm happy to take uh, a couple more if there are additional questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up and say goodnight at this point. Uh, hi. Hello. Um, let me see. Um, I don't appear to now. Um, Nope, I don't see anything remotely suggestive of that. So are, are we're we're off at this point. Okay.
Okay, so for those of you still with us and watching, uh, you see me talking on the phone with Command Central. We've apparently encountered some uh, technical glitches, and because of that, um, I'm going to close at this point. Once again, I want to thank everybody for joining me this evening. I hope you found this to be a helpful and useful program and worth your time. And we're going to end the program at this point. So good night, everybody.